In this video, we're going to discuss the naming conventions for alcohols and alkyl halides. And this video is going to be quite a bit shorter than the previous one because the majority of the rules and conventions for naming organic compounds come into play in the alkane nomenclature problem. So now that we've addressed the alkane nomenclature problem, we actually have the tools available to name a huge variety of organic compounds. But we need to expand these ideas a little bit along two directions. First of all, we need to add more substituents to our toolbox. So, so far we've talked about alkyl substituents, which just contain carbon and hydrogen single bonds, but we'll expand the toolbox in this video to include alkyl halides and the hydroxyl group of alcohols. The other direction we need to expand is to consider different ways to name the parent chain. So in compounds that have a functional group that's of primary importance, like the hydroxyl group is for alcohols, we actually name and define the parent chain by appealing to this functional group. We'll see how that works in this video. Let's begin with a brief overview of the process we developed in the last video to name alkanes. Step one is to find and number the parent chain and identify the base name of this parent chain. In this video, we're going to expand on this step by examining different ways to identify, number, and name the parent chain based on the presence of a key functional group, like a hydroxyl group. Step two is to identify the substituents and their positions. And again, in this video, we're going to add to our toolbox of substituents that we recognize to move beyond alkyl groups and look at other types of functional groups found in organic compounds. And then step three is to list the substituents with their positions as prefixes to the base name. And this step is largely going to remain the same except for the names that we add to our toolbox of substituents. So we're going to increase the versatility and the flexibility of this process. First of all, let's talk about adding to the substituent toolbox in the context of the alkyl halides. Alkyl halides contain a halogen atom bound to an sp3 hybridized carbon. And the four halogens you find in alkyl halides are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. These substituents are named by taking the ene out of the name of the element and replacing it with O. So F is the fluoro substituent, Cl is the chloro substituent, Br is the bromo substituent, and I is the iodo substituent. Aside from these new names, there's pretty much nothing new about naming alkyl halides. We treat them just like alkanes, noting that these substituents are just additions to our toolbox of substituents that we recognize. Let's do a quick example of naming an alkyl halide using the compound here. I'm going to show you two ways to do this. One that is the IUPAC systematic nomenclature way, and another way that names the compound as an alkyl halide that is occasionally seen but is less commonly used, and I won't ask you to use this, but just for completeness, I like to show it here. So the IUPAC way to name this compound is just like we did for the alkanes, first of all, to find the parent chain. There's really only one chain of carbon atoms in this compound, and we find it running in this direction, kind of along the bottom of the molecule. To number this compound, we use the idea that we want to give the fluorine substituent the smallest number possible, which is an idea we're familiar with already. And so we number from right to left, like so, so that the fluorine gets the number 2, as opposed to the number 4, which it would get if we started numbering the opposite direction. Now we name the substituent as 2-fluoro. And we know that the base name, because the length of the chain is 5 carbons, it's a pentane. The name of this compound is 2-fluoropentane. Now, how else can we name this compound? Well, we can think of it in a way as a salt of a halide. So even though the carbon-fluorine bond is decidedly covalent, in the old days it was common to think of this as a fluoride salt. So fluoride actually appears in the name. And notice the correspondence between fluoride and halide, and this is how the names look in general using this naming convention. And we name the alkyl group as an alkyl substituent coming from the fluorine. So now the focus is on the fluorine, and we actually think of the entire alkyl group as a substituent. So we would call this a 2-pentyl. Since the pentyl chain is bound to the fluorine at the 2 position, this is 2-pentyl fluoride. 
This bottom convention is far less common, but I just show it to you as a point of historical interest and in case you encounter names like this out there on the web. When it comes to naming alcohols, we actually need to develop an entirely new convention for naming the parent chain. And the compound here illustrates what we need to do. So if we were to name this in the same way we name alkanes, the clever among you would see that the parent chain in this compound, according to those rules, is the one that runs this direction. This is the longest continuous chain of carbons in this compound. However, according to the IUPAC nomenclature, this is not the parent chain. And the issue is that it does not contain the hydroxyl group. In alcohols, the parent chain must contain the hydroxyl group. That's really important to keep in mind. The parent chain now is the longest continuous chain that contains the hydroxyl group. It's very important to include the hydroxyl group in the parent chain. So here, we're essentially obliged to start at this carbon bound to the hydroxyl group. It's a CH2OH group, and because it includes the hydroxyl group and it's bound only to one other carbon, we know it's going to show up in the parent chain. And we walk along and get to this branching point, and in fact, you'll notice that both branches include three carbons, so we can move in either direction. Just to keep things simpler visually, I'm going to keep moving in this direction. And we've identified the parent chain, and the chain has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. And notice that I've numbered the chain to minimize the numbers assigned to the substituents. We have a one substituent the OH group, which we'll talk about in a second, and we have a 3-propyl substituent. This 3-propyl group would get the number 4 if we started numbering from the other end of the parent chain. Because this is an alcohol, the base name is a little bit different. We still need to include hexan to indicate the length of the parent chain is 6 carbons long, but because it contains a hydroxyl group, we're going to call this hexan all. The ol suffix is a dead giveaway for an alcohol. Because different isomers of alcohols with the same number of carbons might have the hydroxyl group at different positions along the chain of carbons, we need a number to indicate the position of the hydroxyl group. And here, notice that the hydroxyl group is at position 1, so this is a 1 hexanol. We integrate the propyl substituent into the name the same way we would integrate any substituent into the name of a compound as a leading prefix. And so this is 3-propyl, 1-hexanol. The key difference between naming alcohols and naming alkanes is, again, the presence of this all suffix and a number right before the base name that indicates the position of the hydroxyl group. In older examples, you'll actually see this number wedged between hexane and all to indicate the position of the hydroxyl group, but I like keeping the hexanol together and putting the number out front, and you'll see this in more modern examples. Keep in mind that the parent chain of an alcohol must include the hydroxyl group. Polyols are compounds that contain more than one hydroxyl group, and naming these is similar to the process for naming alcohols with only one hydroxyl group. We still need to make sure that the parent chain includes all of the hydroxy substituents, and as we saw for multiple copies of alkyl groups and alkanes, we use di, tri, and tetra here to indicate the presence of multiple OH groups. So in this compound, we see that the parent chain is five carbons long, and I've highlighted it in green. We number it from left to right so that the hydroxyl group on the left gets the number one. And to identify the fact that this compound contains two hydroxyl groups, at the very end of the name, we add diol. Immediately preceding diol, we indicate the base name of the corresponding alkyl chain. So this is a five carbon chain, so this is pentane diol. This is a little bit strange and kind of esoteric, but the E is maintained when we use di, tri, and tetra. Remember, we lost the E, for example, in pentanol and hexanol. As we did for alcohols containing one hydroxyl group, we need to add numbers to show the positions of the hydroxyl groups in a polyol. And as we saw in naming alkanes, we need a number of locants or a number of numbers that corresponds to the di, tri, or tetra prefix that you see right here. So a diol needs two numbers. And this is a 1,2 diol because we see hydroxyl groups at the 1 and 2 positions. And that's more or less the only complication that comes from naming polyols. 
other substituents are added before the 1,2-pentane diol. They'd be added over here if they were present, just as we saw for alkanes and for plain vanilla alcohols with only one hydroxyl group.